every time that you can do that for your students, predict their difficulty, they think, wow, Rachel really is an expert on the student journey. And so she told me that I was going to have these feelings. She told me this is what I was going to be worrying about during this time. And so I should listen to her. I should um, kind of internalize what she's saying is coming. And I don't have to be anxious because she really knows what she's talking about. So you help them with their expectations. You also create some expertise for them to be able to lean on for you. Hello, everybody. Good to see you joining us or know you're joining us later by podcast. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success for Ferris Resources, and this is Cap and Gown. Um, man, it is November, which is amazing because I didn't think we were going to make it through October. So good work. Um, we're on the home stretch of this semester. We have not enrolled coming up and we have Thanksgiving break and then winter break. So you guys are slowly but surely making it. I have to tell you that I am alone today. I mean, I'm not really alone because Rachel Elam is on to send you links and to monitor chat. And Trey is in the, the room with me to make sure that all our AV stuff is working. But I don't have Matt sitting next to me, which I usually do because he and Viva, our director of retention intelligence, are um, presenting at CSRDE, which is a data conference. It's virtual this year, but that's what they're doing right now. So I'm glad to see so many of my friends joining. Um, a couple of things that I want to tell you about. First of all, if you're joining me on Zoom, you just will have to be patient with me because I am having to share my screen as well as talk and sound like I know what I'm doing. So we might have a little bit of lag there. But um, for everybody joining us, if you want to go back and, and listen to old recordings, or if you want to listen to us um, or watch us on Zoom, you can go to taplink.cc slash Ferris Resources. Also want to tell you all that we in the last two weeks have launched our Instagram account. So please go follow us there. We are just now getting back in the swing of things in terms of being able to travel to campuses and do conferences and all of that fun stuff that we um, love so much to do. And so a lot of that will be featured there on Instagram as well as um, information that we're pushing out to help you with your work. Today, I am going to talk about the State of the Union, and actually we're going to spend quite a bit of time there because there's so many different things going on. Uh, as we reach this point in the semester. And then I want to talk about rhythm of the academic year. We have a lot of resources that I think are incredibly useful uh, as you're thinking about what's happening on your campus um, each semester, depending on the month and depending on where you are in that semester. And so we're going to spend um, a lot of time talking about that. And then I have action items for you as well. So let's start with our State of the Union couple of different things that I want to point out to you. So I know that you guys have seen some of the results that are coming in in terms of um, college enrollment numbers for the fall. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. We obviously have a lot of pandemic recovery signs all throughout higher education. So many of you are open again and you're having classes in person and you either have vaccine mandates or you're doing masks or whatever, but enrollment is really um, still struggling. So the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center has some data that uh, shows that enrollment has fallen 3.2% for a two-year decline of around 6.5% that that fall was that fall was in the fall. That decline was in the fall. So that is the largest drop in 50 years by a very wide margin. Um, enrollments are still getting worse. Previously, the worst two-year uh, enrollment period was a 3.3% decline percent decline from 2011 to 2013, but that was right after um, the Great Recession, which was really good for higher education because lots of people, when they couldn't get a job, they went to college or they went on to get their master's degree. So those declines weren't as bad because we had really reached a peak and then we were seeing declines after that. Um, the steepest drop off this year is at uh, private for profits. So you remember, we always make this distinction of our for profit institutions. 
um, their enrollments have tumbled 13% for 2021. And then we know our community colleges, two-year institutions have seen a 5.6 dive this fall. Overall, since the pandemic began, their enrollment is down 14%. So for public four-year four -year institutions, they fall in, this fall another 2.3%. And then private nonprofits um, had about a 1% decline uh, after the, fall, the drop from fall 2020. So the nice thing is that we are seeing a graduate enrollment spike of up about 5%. Um, and so that's hopeful. Also take into account what's happening with international students. So when the pandemic started and there was a lot of legal changes about uh, international students, that accounts for about an 8% drop uh, for our institutions, just thinking of all of those international students that we weren't able to enroll anymore. So that's really interesting. Like I said, community colleges are the hardest hit. Um, and what's really surprising is that often when there's an economic decline, we see increases in um, college enrollment, because again, when people can't get jobs or don't want to get the jobs that they that are available, they might choose to go to higher education. We're not seeing that this time. So people are really interested in why that might be. Okay, you guys have heard me talk about the book that I've been reading, The Price of College, and how there's a chapter on there about the discounted rate and how it's very confusing and didn't make any sense to me. I had to work really hard to understand it. Well, there's an article in Inside Higher Ed called Tuition Revenue, Where's All the Money that I would highly recommend. And it basically just goes through and explains what where all the money is. So when we're saying an institution charges $50,000 for tuition and they have 2,000 students, that's $100 million. Where did all that money go? We're not taking to, uh, into account there that, uh, that discount rate. And so this article that Rachel is chatting to you, or it's called Tuition Revenue, Where's All the Money? Great article to kind of go through and explain how schools are making that determination, how they're deciding what that discount rate um, might be, and then also how that's affecting schools' bottom line when it comes to talking about the budget and the money that they having, have coming in. Okay, I have a couple articles for you um, about sort of as the pandemic has um, played itself out, some of the impacts that we're seeing there, the American Higher, uh, sorry, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, which is the AIHEC, just did a survey of 486 students who are returning to their tribal colleges um, and found nearly a quarter of students who could meet their mental health needs before the pandemic were no longer able to do so during the pandemic. And then 13% of students said they were both unable to meet those needs during and before the pandemic. So you have a gap of students who weren't able to have access to care even before the academic, uh, before the pandemic came about. Hey, Sherry, good to see you. Um, also, the number of deaths for Indian communities throughout this pandemic has been really staggering. Students, that means that they may be sick, but also they're navigating sick family members and their academic uh, issues and childcare issues. It's just a lot of pressure for these students. So of note, the COVID mortality rate for Native Americans in Montana is 3.8 times higher that um, than of white residents. And um, there have been nationally about 8,000 deaths of those Native Americans. One thing that this article points out that I found really upsetting is that just like for an average college student, um, we have a lot of widespread grief among our students' employees. However, on our tribal colleges, usually if a family member of a student passes away or an employee passes away, the college holds a ceremony that they call the wiping of tears, where campus employees share a meal with the mourners and then the tribal elders who are really, really important um, figures in that community will come and pray for them and everybody gets together around them because of COVID, they haven't been able to do that. So they tried to do live stream of that and nobody came because it is not a replacement for that community really surrounding you and, and being close to you and mourning with you. So there's a lot of difficulty in our tribal colleges, a lot of people are trying to figure out what's the best way to um, help them recover and also provide their students uh, support. 
food pantries also, you guys know we've talked about this several times. There's been a new um, arrangement between the College and University Food Bank Alliance and an organization called Swipe Out Hunger. These two organizations are going to work together. They've kind of been in partnership since 2015, but are trying to expand. This merger is going to mean they're going to go from 145 campuses that they serve to nearly 1,000. Um, they also are going to establish a $100,000 fund to distribute micro grants to campus pantries that join the network. So they're just working really, really hard to make sure that our students have food. Uh, it's interesting. I'm glad Sherry has joined us because, you know, we did a lot of research early in the pandemic about what was affecting students and this food insecurity came out and I think it surprised everybody. It was kind of a hidden thing before. Um, a lot of the uh, survey data that's coming out of the Swipe Out Hunger um, survey says 29% of college students have missed at least one meal a week since the start of the pandemic, and more than half of the students, 52%, used off-campus food banks during the pandemic. 30% of them used um, them once a month or more. So, uh, you know, we're always talking about kintsugi and how things get broken and we can make them back more beautiful and more effective than before. I'm grateful for this data to uncover what's happening with students, but also really heartbroken. Um, at the widespread uh, need for food pantries for our students and for their families. Okay, a couple more things I want to talk to you about. So um, two years ago, the Assistant United States Attorney in New York City, Leslie Cornfield, launched the National Education Equity Lab to help more low-income and first-generation high school students make the jump to selective colleges. So the Equity Lab model is designed to scale courses offered at elite institutions. They offer them by Zoom. They give these students a grade. Um, they started by offering a Harvard University Humanities class to 25 high schools in 11 cities. Since launching in 2019, the Ed Equity Lab will have offered college courses to approximately 8,000 students from Title I high schools, which means there's 40% of the students qualify for free lunch, for a reduced lunch. It is now operating in 90 cities and 32 states. Their institutional partners are Stanford, Howard, Princeton, Wesleyan, Cornell, uh, the Wharton School um, from Pennsylvania, Arizona State. 90% of participating high school students are minorities and an overwhelming majority will be first generation college students. So what I love about this is they're basically saying, if we can provide opportunities for these students to learn and to get college credit, then they're gonna go on to be really successful. So uh, their mantra is that talent is evenly distributed and opportunity is not. Um, what I really appreciate is that during this pandemic, 80% of the students taking these college courses passed receiving university transcripts and three college credits. And they're like, this is not about ed tech. This is about us making sure that our students are getting connected with college grad students as teaching fellows to grade work and meet with the students regularly, offering office hours with professors over Zoom, everything that you can do in terms of student support to help these students be successful. And what's awesome is that it's a way for these students to, first of all, know that they can succeed in these really difficult classes, but also demonstrate because of past performance that they will be successful moving forward. So it gives them a pipeline into these schools and also gives them some academic confidence about their abilities. So I love that. That is very exciting. Two more things for you. Um, one is the state of Hawaii is looking at tenure for teachers. There's a lot to be said in this article, again, inside higher ed. Rachel's chatting that to you if you wanna see it. But what I wanna talk about here is that they had a task force come together and say, we wanna have a new definition from tenure uh, of tenure. And you guys know I'm always talking about how do we provide scaffolding and opportunities for faculty to interface with students and to value that and give them a reward to say that is actually part of your job and we have to make that very, very clear and we have to give you ways to kind of reward you for that. So this 10 year task force said they, they're recommending that the board says that all tenure and tenure track positions are filled by faculty who are engaged in direct instruction and active engagement with students. 
So we want you to actually be seeing your students, connecting with them, helping solve their problems, spending time in the classroom, not just based on academic research, which is very different for many of our very big schools. There's a lot of emphasis on that um, research and academic achievement. Also, they must currently um, fill the requirements and strategic growth priorities for the university. So whatever those things are, we wanna see that faculty are contributing to that. Also, they have to have relevant in, uh, contributions to the institution's missions and goals. They need to prioritize the necessity for, faculties to be, uh, for faculty to be adaptable in meeting the changing needs of students and the university, including changes in the mode of delivery for the institution, which I think is really interesting because it's like, hey, as we recruit different students and get new students, as that input changes, you need to be ready to meet their needs. Also, as we're using new technologies, you have to be willing to adopt to that. And I think what they're fighting against is faculty members who have had the same lecture for the last you know, 35 years. And because they're tenured, they've not had to be um, kind of thoughtful and innovative of how they're delivering that. So I love that. And then also the last piece is, yes, we want you to do research, but it has to advance innovation, create new knowledge and benefit students as well as the broader community. So I just love the articulation of community impact, student engagement, student success, moving along with the times um, that Hawaii is really connecting to this idea of tenured faculty, uh, which I think is getting a lot of um, examination these days. So good job, guys. All right, the last one is a shout out to one of our schools, Asbury University. They have just announced that they are committed to making Christian higher education possible for all Kentucky students who desire a private Christian college degree, regardless of that, their economic situation. So starting next fall, they are going to guarantee 100% tuition coverage for any first-time freshman student from Kentucky who receive federal Pell Grant assistance and have a minimum of a 3.0 high school GPA. So it's renewable for up to three years, covers eight academic se semesters total. Um, it does not include room and board. However, Asbury's room and board fees are some of the most affordable in Kentucky. So we love our partnership with Asbury. And anytime I see a school really investing in closing that equity gap um, and supporting students who need extra support, I'm thrilled. So that is the State of the Union. I remember to say at this time, also, Trey and Matt put together a compilation of all of the times I forgot to say, and that is the State of the Union. And so maybe if you are very fortunate, one of these times they will slip it in and you'll be able to watch my consternation every time I forget to say that. Thanks for joining me for the State of the Union. All right, I want to move over now to our topic for today, which is about the rhythm of the academic year. I think this is especially relevant as we're making the transition into November. Um, I talk to schools all the time about the rhythm of the academic year, and I find it to be a really powerful way to sort of organize our thinking about what's going on and how we can be investing in our student success. So let me explain where this comes from and how we adapt it to use it on our campuses. First of all, um, there's a sort of principle in counseling, which is that if you can predict difficulty for your client, if you can say, hey, you're, you want to stop smoking. And so the first day you're going to do great. But the second day, the second day is the hardest. So when you wake up on the second day and you really, really are craving a cigarette, just remember everything's normal. That's the way it's supposed to go. The second day is the hardest. And then it's going to get easier after that. I don't know that that's true, but just say, right. Anytime you can predict something for a client, it does a couple of things. We know it normalizes it for them. So we know that it makes them feel like, oh, things are going exactly the way that they should be. There's no surprise here. Even before I experienced this difficulty, Rachel told me that it was going to happen. Also, it gives you a lot of credibility. So every time that you can do that for your students, predict their difficulty, they think, wow, Rachel really is an expert on the student journey. And so she told me 
that I was going to have these feelings. She told me this is what I was going to be worrying about during this time. And so I should listen to her. I should um, kind of internalize what she's saying is coming. And I don't have to be anxious because she really knows what she's talking about. So you help them with their expectations. You also create some expertise for them to be able to lean on for you. The other thing I would say is that I find that so many of us love academics because of this very predictable rhythm of our year. And one of the things that I think has been so difficult about the pandemic is that the ebb and flow and the times where we know it's really hard because it's midterm, but then it settles down a little bit as we go into the end of October. And then we, all of those things are all jumbled up. And so we didn't have a settled summer. we now have not had two settled summers where we kind of slow down and we do some reflection and planning for the future. Also the semesters, because I've seen um, Viva and Matt have been doing spark reports for so many of you, and I have seen the additional hours in a semester that are spent on COVID hundreds and hundreds of hours just on your COVID interventions and tracking and trying to, to keep track of that on, on top of everything else you've been doing. So we haven't had this sort of um, hill and valley of the academic year that we're so used to. It's felt like it's just ramped up and it's just stayed there for the last 22 months. It's really distressing because so many of us love the fresh start of August and the ramp up and the getting to know new people and learn new things and then moving into the middle of the semester and then the things that we do to end the semester. And then we have this break in December where we take a breath and we think about the spring and then we do it again. And then we have sprum, uh, summer, like I said, to plan and reflect and think about new initiatives. And that really has been broken. But I do think it is such a powerful rhythm that we love in um, academics that we introduce our students to and we talk to them about this is the way that it goes and this is the rhythm that you want to get used to. And so um, that rhythm is very unlike many uh, industries, many businesses. There's obviously some of that where you have very busy seasons, maybe in Christmas or in the summer, but we just have this very clear week by week flow of what's going on for our students. And so I think being able to speak that to them and predict this is what's going to be coming. This is what's happening. This is what you want to be looking for. is a really powerful way, like I said, to normalize that for them, but also to help them see that you know what you're talking about and what's going on with them is predictable. The last thing I'll say is that um, I always get really tickled when I think about the difference between the academic side of the house and the student life side of the house and how those are obviously so different in so many of our minds because we understand the jobs that those two do and the things that they provide and, and yet um, we provide holistic support for students. And so the academic side of the house has to know, you know, October is the time where they're starting to go crazy because of their roommate. Their roommate has now, like the newness has worn off and they're starting, every little thing is starting to annoy them, right? Academic side of the house should know that. That's why they're coming in late or they're staying up too late or they're not getting their homework done or there are some academic symptoms that come out of that piece. And the student life side has to know, you know, when you get your first grade and you've never gotten anything below an A and you get a C, you're going to be a little crabby. It's going to be difficult in the rest halls and in your clubs because you feel overwhelmed and you don't know what to do. And so looking at this, like the rhythm of the academic year in a holistic sense, we have both sides of the house that have different things that are going on and are, are contributing to student stress and anxiety and also joy and excitement in two different ways. When you can articulate that for your community and for your campus, you're all much better able to provide support for students with whatever it is that's going on in that rhythm um, of the academic year. So I have a lot of resources for you around this. Um, I want to talk about how we use this with our students and with our campuses, and then I'll tell you some of the opportunities you have to get some of the resources that we have. So I have a list. This is based on um, an Austin and Sousa and Chickering um, article from around 1991, 93, sometime in that frame where they just went through and they said really specifically, here are the things that we see happening with the academic year. 
I've taken this and I've adapted this um, and I've changed it from just uh, here's bullet points of everything that, that might be happening. I've given every month a theme and then I've said, hey, this is what your students are thinking about. These are the struggles. This is what's happening with them. And then here's what you should be considering. You should be thinking about from their perspective, what's happening, questions you should be asking them, topics that you wanna be addressing. Um, I really like what should be on your mind because so many of our schools are doing RA check-ins. So resident advisors are expected every week to do a check-in with all of their residents. And we've actually built out specific questions based on the rhythm of the academic year. So if we're in you know, midterm season, then RAs want to be saying, how's it going with your midterms? Are you studying? Have you gotten your results back? How did it go? Being able to kind of guide um, questions and conversations based on what is happening in that ryth rhythm of the academic year, I think is really powerful. I've also gone through and I've given you your relational retention interventions for any period of the semester. So um, if you think about when should I be doing surveys, when should I be asking students particular questions, when should I be connecting with admissions or with financial aid or the registrar, what are the interventions that I can be doing in every season of the semester and every season of the year to make sure that we are identifying students who are struggling and then able to come back and connect and solve their problems. I've given you that as well. And then I always am really curious to hear on every campus, there are campus specific issues. So if you think about where I went to school, we had, um, what is it? It's spring, a uh, sing song. So all of the clubs have to do this big program and they stay up all night for like a month and a half practicing and rehearsing. And then there's this big show. And so you just know during sing song season that students are not their best. They're exhausted, they're getting sick, they're tired, faculty know, student life knows. Um, and so being able to say on our campus during this season, here's what's happening with our campus specific issues, I think is really powerful. In fact, for those of you joining me, I'd be really curious to hear any of those campus specific things where you're like, oh, we know this is the season where everyone's doing pledging, or this is the season where everybody is participating in sing song or any of those other big things that you just know on campus is an issue that you want to be looking out for. So um, like I said, I have a lot of, I, I have monthly videos that I've done that I would be happy to give you access to. As I said before, I'm on my own today, so I don't have an elegant way to get you these videos except if you email me, rachel at ferrisresources.com, I can send you all of the links. So many of our schools are using those videos, not only for their own um, like information, but also to be able to send them out to other people on campus and to just say like in your uh, student success and retention newsletter that you're doing every month, hey, here's a one minute video on what's happening with our students and the things that we're doing to try to help them. So if you're interested in that, I'll give you that uh, email address again at the end, but it's rachel at ferrisresources.com. Also, we have calendars that you can put on your desk so that you can see every month all of the different elements that are really important. Um, and then also emails to your campus partner. So like I said, in those newsletters, for you to be able to say, it's November, this is what you need to be looking out for, these are the things that we're doing, and this is what's happening with each of our students. So I wanna go over um, the themes of each of the months, and then I will talk a little bit about them, and then we'll spend most of our time actually in the meat of November so that we can kind of apply that and say this is how this would be helpful to you. So I do love the rhythm of the academic year because I know as you go through each of these different months, you just have that feeling, the reality of those months washing over you. You'll be able to remember so clearly. So if we think about August, we think about a new place. This is true for our freshmen. So they haven't come before, um, they haven't been to campus before, they haven't lived here before, but so many of our other students as well, whether you're a sophomore and you're living in a new um, actual location, a new res hall, or you have a house off campus, or if you think about just a junior thinking about, oh my goodness, I'm half done, what, uh, what are my new classes, what do I need to do in terms of internships, all of that is new every single semester as you think about those different cohorts. Um, coming to your campus. So thinking about making a fresh start, both for our freshmen, um, a way to kind of break from home, which can be really exciting, but also really scary. 
Um, but then also the idea of uh, thinking through how am I going to settle here? Do I belong here? Is this a place where I'm going to be able to be successful? Um, lots of anxiety about roommates and professors. And then also one of the things that I love to predict for our students is to say, don't forget that everybody sort of doubts their choice of school. So when you have come to campus and you just wonder if you've made the right choice, as you're talking to your friends back home and they've made different choices, have you made a good decision? That is totally normal. And we would expect that you would have those uh, thoughts as you've come to this campus. Okay, September, we talk about settling in. So September is really about um, trying to figure out uh, if you are going to fit here. This is where that sense of belonging so, so early when students get to campus, they're making these split second decisions about, is this a good place for me? Am I going to find people to connect with? Is this a place that I can settle in and be success uh, successful? So that's what we talk about in September. In October, we talk about reality check. So October is um, roommate problems are starting to arise, right? The shine is kind of off that relationship. And so, like I said, you're starting to get frustrated. Also remember in October, a lot of times students are getting their first major grade. And so they're feeling stressed about that. There's some academic pressure, wondering whether or not they're gonna be able to cut it. Lots of sort of academic issues that are coming out in October. November, unfortunately, the theme for November is stress. And so I'm going to dive into that uh, more deeply after I go over all of these in general. But um, we had our staff meeting this morning. We were like, man, October was really, really stressful. And I was like, well, I have bad news. The theme of November is stress. So hopefully we can help our students with being able to be equipped to manage uh, the stress that's coming this month. December, the theme is bittersweet. So you'll know they have anxiety about going home for um, the holiday and our students are really different, right? Some students would, it's like Hogwarts, Hogwarts right? It's like Harry Potter's like, I wanna stay all the time. I don't wanna go home. I'm stressed about having to go back to my house. And then you have other people who are like, it's joyful for me to go home. I'm really happy to be able to have a break. So that's kind of bittersweet, both the leaving of your new community, some of the stresses about going home, um, and then also the excitement about that. Lots of anxiety and sleeplessness as our students are thinking about finals um, and making sure that we are kind of cramming. Also remember they're thinking about next semester plans. So for freshmen, am I gonna come back for my spring semester or am I calling it quits? Do I wanna transfer somewhere? Um, thinking through how you're doing connections with the registrar or financial aid. Did this student request a transcript? If so, we need to figure out what to do with them. So a lot of, um, a lot of things happening in December for our students. Okay, and then we go home for Christmas break in a normal rhythm of the academic year. And we come back in January and we have a fresh start. And so you just know this feeling of for students where the fall semester did not go well, they have a chance to come back. Um, they're definitely a little bit stressed about what's happening for them, but they are thinking about given the impact of my last term grades, how can I make a fresh start? Be thinking about um, your transfer students and your students who are coming, this is their first semester, how do you connect with them and make sure that they have a community? And also I love in January for our academic recovery students and for really all of our students being able to say, listen, success is still possible. I wanna to speak to our students, a success is possible message in every way that I can, whether it's in those academic recovery meetings, whether it's like, hey, Hey, we're starting again. What's so nice about higher education is you finished those five classes, but now you have new ones and you can do whatever you want in those classes. You can be wildly successful in them because this is a chance to start over. I love that in January. Also thinking about those academic recovery uh, meetings. February, we call the hardest month um, because we started our fresh start in January but now we're actually in the thick of it, right? Now we're actually having to do all of the work and go to class every day. Also for so many of our schools, it's super cold. Um, and so people are getting claustrophobic because of the bad weather, they can't be outside. Um, we always say that in February, our campuses feel much, much smaller. Tempers are much shorter and our tension is increased because it's dark and cold. And we're kind of mushed together um, in an average year, uh, spending time indoors together. This is the place where you guys would be doing your stoplight surveys to try to identify those students who are at risk. 
Um, and then also, again, remember your transfer students there. Okay, March, our theme is spring fever because um, first of all, students are feeling excited or disappointed about their spring break plans. They're having a lot of anxiety around their midterms. You want to begin to think about your fall registration. Remember, students have a lot of anxiety in this month about picking their roommate next semester. Are they happy with their major? What's their schedule going to look like? So there's lots of opportunities in March to kind of craft a future vision of success um, for your students. Uh, and then also we're looking at midterm grades in that month. April, uh, next semester plans is our theme. So we have a uh, continuing spring fever feeling a little bit of panic if they haven't been able to find their roommates or feeling some tension about their friendships and where they fit. Do they feel abandoned? Do they have an easy um, connection? Also a lot of end of the semester uh, pressure there. Remember your academic probation students in April because it's becoming clear now whether they're gonna be relieved of academic recovery or if there are gonna be some consequences because they haven't been successful. So I'm always encouraging schools um, to think about those students. And then May, our theme is finish well. So we have final exams. We have the same kind of excitement and apprehension over our students returning home for the summer. Um, you wanna be thinking about how you stay connected to them, which you all have done a great job for the last two years of doing that over the summer, although it is a lot of work. Um, but also be thinking about how we help our students to say goodbye uh, to each other. So all of those different themes, if you think about creating a common language for our campuses to be able to talk about student experiences. And like I said, I would put on those lists, like what is happening for your campus in each of those pieces? I'm thinking about Holland's that has their, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's where their president um, calls a day early in the semester, I think it's like September, October, and they all hike up the mountain and eat a picnic lunch of fried chicken on the top of the mountain and then come back down. That would be a great thing to say, like in the rhythm of the academic year, that's a place where you're gonna have some rest and relaxation and it's gonna be exciting. And you're gonna be able to, oh, Rachel, thank you. Rachel's reminding me, Tinker Day, um, where you can look forward to that. That is part of that rhythm. It's not all stress and anxiety. There are also things that we get really excited about and we're looking forward to and we can't wait for those to come. So casting that vision for people on your campus to be able to say this is how we're going to talk about what's happening in each of these pieces of the rhythm of the academic year. So I want to dive in you guys to November. Specifically I want to think about the stress that is happening on our campus. Um, I don't, I'm sure that I'm late to this party, but I have just recently found out that Yik Yak has come back. You remember when this was like five years ago, Yik Yak was the thing where people were posting all sorts of stuff. And then now apparently it's coming back as all things do. Um, I was looking today on Yik Yak uh, for our local campus. And I was thinking about this theme of stress. And I just want to read, this is like literally the, as I'm looking through the top, like seven Yik yaks. Here's what people are saying. I'm, I tried to sleep my problems away and tell myself I'm okay, but I'm really not. Anyone else having more bad days or just okay days lately? The weekend can't be my only good day. I need some rest. Okay. Next one. I physically cannot bring myself to be productive in any way, shape, or fashion. Someone needs to take me to what they call their referral, like our the Ferris supported early alert system. Someone needs to take me to the early alert before I drop out of life. Currently depressed at 12.45 a.m., crying, my life is falling apart. Should I make an appointment at early alert? Is it effective? I need help. The semester needs to be over, it's too much. Last one, I need a massive whiteboard on my wall to map out all my thoughts and feelings. I feel like this is the place where students are just in the thick of it and starting to feel really overwhelmed. And I know you guys are hearing this from students. I think it's exacerbated because of all of the COVID junk that we've been through. Um, but in a general year, November is very, very difficult. So our students are thinking about midterms. We have those coming up. Um, and they're stressed thinking about their academic progress so far. So that is a thing to be thinking about 
guiding conversations, creating programs about when you're engaging with students this month, I would just ask them, how are you feeling about midterms? Do you feel stressed about it? Do you have a plan? Do you know that we have tutoring? Do you know that we have the ACE lab? Do you know we have all of these resources to be able to help you? Getting that message out to everybody on campus who's going to come in, uh, in, in contact with a student will help make sure that we have good coverage for students to be able to talk about things that they're stressful, they find stressful. Um, also, like I said, roommate conflict. So we are just about done with each other. The room is as messy as it's going to get. You've woken me up every single morning for your eight o'clock class. Um, and I'm just about done with you. So thinking about for RAs, how do we craft conversations to say, hey guys, this is the place when it gets hardest. You haven't had a break from each other. You're gonna go home from Thanksgiving. That will be really nice. And then you'll have a longer break and you'll come back. But also just running programming in our res halls about conflict resolution, about how hard it is to be able to live with another person, even that you really, really like, how difficult it is to live in close proximity with them day after day after day, much less when we get to the place where a lot of other things are causing us stress and anxiety. Really great place for conversation. Anxiety and excitement before Thanksgiving. So Thanksgiving is so close, but so far away for so many of us. Um, I really like the idea in November of talking to students about how they can use the next three weeks before Thanksgiving break to make a difference in act academics, in their social life, in their mental health, in their physical well-being. What are things that you can commit to for the next three weeks? Can you go to sleep before 10 for the next three weeks? Can you spend an hour in the library studying? What This is a really short amount of time before you get a break. What are some good um, goals and behaviors that we can say, I don't know that I can do it for the whole semester, but I definitely can do it for the next three weeks. How do we help our students set goals and have good expectations of that? And then also, this is the place where if you have been skipping classes or you have not been doing your um, homework, the, a long enough time has gone that you are starting to really feel overwhelmed with that success debt. You're starting to think, I don't know that I can recover from this. I feel like maybe it's so bad that I am gonna fail the class. Should I keep trying? Should I just stop the class? What should I do? So all of that accumulation, if you have any of that success debt, it's starting to feel really, really overwhelming. Um, so those are some of the things that our students are thinking about this month. Make sure that you are thinking about spring registration. I know that it's early. I know that you, some of you have just started registration in the last couple of weeks. I know you still have a long list of students who are not registered. But I like thinking about spring registration in this month because you have a long time to go and talk to students and say, hey, what's going on with you? So thinking about barriers for them to register, is it that they don't know their advisor? Okay, we can solve that problem. That's an email exchange where we just say, listen, this is your advisor, you should go see them. Is it that they don't love their major and so they don't actually want to pick their next classes and they don't want to talk to their advisor because they feel stressed out about the fact that they don't love their major, they maybe need to change it. That's a great conversation for us to have. That's something that we can help them um, overcome. Are they thinking about leaving? Is there something we can do to kind of help them bridge that gap to, no, I actually do want to come back next semester. So those are questions that are so helpful for our RAs to be helping us with. And it's a much easier to get that information when our students are on campus, as opposed to if we wait until the December break when they've already gone home, and then it's harder, we have to try to text them or whatever. In this case, we actually know where they are for so many of them, especially freshmen, we can go and start having those conversations. And we have a really long runway to be able to solve the problems. Like, let's get you into career counseling, let's decide what the right major is so that then we can get you registered so you don't lose any ground there. So spring registration in November, I think is really, really key. I also would say if you start those engagements before students go home and spend time with their parents and their parents are like, hey, how's it going? And they're saying, it's not going great. I don't love my major. I don't feel connected. I'm thinking about something else. You can, can change that conversation that they're having at home if you will start running that list of not enrolled and start having those conversations. It's a great way to kind of recover and help them feel like, hey, we really do see you when we want you to be here. Um, it's important to our community that you come back. So spring registration, super important on that list. Also illness on campus without COVID, this is when illness is happening. Um, I'm always reminded of students who are far away from home, 
don't have cars, don't have people to care for them, um, being able to really think through how are we providing support for our students. I know for so many of you that Viva um, has been doing spark reports for retention of students who were in COVID um, quarantine or isolation for so many of you is higher than the average student because it really is a place where they felt cared for, supported, seen, connected. So great job on that. And I think we're gonna be able to care for our students who just are gonna have the run of the mill flu in November so much better because we have this experience now with what a student who's sick really needs from their campus community. And then the last thing is make sure you're considering high stress, which makes us all a little bit crazy. So what it means is that things are gonna get amplified, that we have less tolerance, that we're less patient, we're less kind with each other. And I think some of that, again, is just a conversation to say, how are you handling your stress? What are the strategies that you have? Do you work out? Do you journal? Do you talk to a friend? How can we both normalize the fact that November is a really stressful month and also provide conversation to to be able to say to students, these are things that you should be thinking about because this is gonna come around every November. You just have to remember every November is really a difficult month for us. It's really helpful. Um, the last thing that I'll tell you about November, you um, we talked about our not enrolled and under enrolled intervention this month. So um, Matt and I did a really great um, play by play uh, webinar on your under-enrolled and not enrolled population. If you go to YouTube, it is our number seven of our cap and gown. It's called Not Yet Registered. Um, that really goes through how you can not only in sort of process generally, but also use our software to support that. Uh, and I think it will be really helpful. Um, also remember that you should be doing your faculty surveys for students who were previously identified as a yellow or red. You should go back to those um, that group of students and survey your faculty and say, can this student uh, pass? So have they recovered? Uh, are they able to pass? If no, then you wanna get in connection with those students really quickly before your last date to drop so that they don't have um, a negative impact on their GPA and even sometimes financial aid. So that's another great intervention to be doing during this month. I feel like it's a short month because we are going forward um, into the Thanksgiving break. And then it's like December goes by so quickly. So all of those things I think will be really useful as you're casting the conversations to be having the, the way that you're gonna be intrusive with your students and predict what's happening for them. So you can imagine for every month, there's a lot of great conversations um, to be had around each of those pieces. I also would recommend, we have a webinar that's called Predicted Interventions. That's, uh, we just did that one. I think it's number 18. Rachel's chatting that link to you. Um, but that's another really nice way when you say like, we've identified this issue on our campus. Now here are the things that we're going to do to set up support for that student so that when they get to that challenge, we already have that set up. I think that will be a really powerful uh, one for you guys as well. Okay, you guys, action items today. Look, when it's just me, I end early. Um, your action items today are really about you guys being, being able to use the tools that Ferris Resources is providing for your students, your team, for your campus. So if you want access to those videos, we send them out at the beginning of the month and you can distribute those however you want. Like I said, if you wanna put them in your newsletter or if you wanna share them with your team, they literally are a minute long um, and we'll just give you kind of an overview of what's happening in that month. Please email me and I will make sure that you get added to that list. Also make sure that you are talking through with your team how we're gonna address this November stress, whether that's conversations or programming or educating our RAs or making faculty presentations. November's a really rough month. And so be thinking about that for your students, be thinking about that for your teams, be thinking about that for yourself. Um, we were just talking this morning about how last year this time we had been going in, in pandemic stuff for so many months. and. Thanksgiving felt like the first break that we were going to get. And we were saying, you just have to really hold that as sacred and important space for us to take care of our stress and have some downtime and be with our families and do things that are going to help us come back kind of renewed. Um, so make sure you're thinking about that, not just for your students, but for yourself as well. 
Also, those of you who are um, Ferris 360 clients, next semester we are starting our spring 12-week tune-up. So that means that every week we are meeting for 30 minutes to go through some new innovations, some things for you to be thinking about in your software. Um, we're excited about that class. Be looking for that email coming so that you can join us um, and more de details for that. And I'm very excited to announce that before the end of the semester, we are going to be releasing some new features. And so we will be talking more about those and you'll be getting um, invitations to see all of the new things that our development our developers have been building for you uh, to be using as the spring semester starts. So that is always a very exciting part of the semester when we get to um, throw those out. Whew, I didn't have anybody except for you all to talk to today. So thank you for joining me. Um, next week, I think we um, are going to be talking more about some student success elements, maybe even with um, an interview for one of our um, athletes that we're connected to. So look forward to you guys joining me for that um, and have a great day. And that is the State of the Union. I think you should start summing up that way, don't you? And that is the state of the union. A group of college students who want to learn more about cannabis. Yeah, for sure. So, okay, that is the state of the union. Okay, so let, oh, I'm supposed to say, this is my new thing that I'm trying to remember to say. Okay, and that is the state of the union. That is the state of the union in our school. Yeah, I would love that. That would be great. Okay, so Anthony, as, oh, and that, that is the state of the union. I'm trying to I'm trying to remember to say that at the end of the state of the union, but I always forget it and then I have to come back to it. So I don't think it's gonna stick. Okay, so I'm supposed to say at the end of state of the union and that's the state of the union. So I do pretty good on that one, I think. So I understand it, man. I, yeah. I truly, truly understand it. I agree for sure. Okay, so let's, oh, sorry. I, listen, I'm terrible at taglines because I can never remember to say them. Okay, let, sorry, here we go. And that is the state of the union. Right. Anyway, highly recommend that article. I love it. All right, let's, oh shoot, I didn't do, sorry. And that's the state of the union. It's terrible. Trey said that maybe I should just record it and we should put it on a button so that then when I finish, he can just push and then it will just come out. I think you should just keep practicing it. Okay, I thank you. I, I like I, I, the best part of that is you saying, "Oh shoot!" <laughs> I appreciate that you will be in this experiment with me, Anthony. It's very helpful. <laughs> <laughs>